All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the Humanizing Your Brand webinar series sponsored by Online Optimism. I'll be your host, uh, I'm Sam Olmsted, and throughout this six week series, uh, we'll teach you how to connect with your audience, build trust with your customers, and grow your organization by creating a more human brand with a personal touch. Each week we'll be featuring two industry leading experts who have proven track records and insider tips that will help reshape your brand's focus and core messaging. So just wanna pause right here and make sure we still have people that may be trickling in um, and get them up to speed. So um, let's give it a minute and, uh, and just make sure everyone is involved and ready to go. Um, if you're just joining us, we're very excited to have you here this morning. Uh, we encourage you to join our next five webinars, all focused on humanizing your brand and connecting with your audience. Before we get started, let's discuss the format of the webinar and how things are going to go. Uh, each speaker will present for about 20 minutes, and we'll have a 20-minute Q&A after both presentations are complete. Um, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen. Um, if there are questions about the format or the process of the webinar, I can answer them directly in the chat. If the questions are about the presentations themselves or for the speakers directly, um, I'll collect all of the questions. And after both speakers are done, I'll have a verbal Q&A uh, where we can kind of talk aloud and, uh, and ask the questions to the speakers. As your host, I've muted all of the attendees throughout the webinar to cut down on any background noise, uh, but please feel free to add your thoughts in the chat as we go along. Um, we wanna make sure that this is kind of an open dialogue where people feel uh, welcome to, uh, to participate. Last thing is we'll be posting this webinar online and make the link available to everyone. So uh, if you miss anything, feel free to kind of go back and, and rewatch, um, but let's get started. Uh, this is our first week of the Humanizing Your Brand webinar series, and I'm really excited to introduce our first speaker today. Greg Lucy is an Emmy award-winning journalist, entrepreneur, and founder of Lucy, an Atlanta PR firm that shines a light on all the good behind companies and nonprofits. By using his experience as a storyteller, Craig helps organizations create their own news in an effort to humanize their brands. Take it away, Craig. Bam, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining us uh, this morning. It's an honor, Sam, to be the very first speaker in Online Optimism's whole series about humanizing your brand. I absolutely love the word humanize. It's something that I tell clients all the time. So let's jump right into it. I'm gonna start sharing my screen right now and get into this presentation for you all. And feel free to chime in, as Sam mentioned at the bottom with any of your questions. So, you know, here it is. Content is king, humanizing your videos. Uh, Sam gave you a little bit about my background. We're going to jump into that. Um, to tell you a little bit about us, here's some of our crew. We are storytellers, shining a light on everything that you do. So as we know, everyone has a story, but not everyone really knows how to tell that story and make it break through the noise. And let me tell you, there is a lot of noise out there. So we spent our entire careers focusing on finding the right story. And right at the bottom, you can see that we humanize what you do. So two very powerful words, and there it is, humanize and resonate. So what we wanna do for you all here today is humanize your brand, your nonprofit, make you human as an individual. I know it sounds kind of silly, but in order to do that, you do it with content that will resonate with the viewer. So uh, for those of you that don't know my background, I'm going to jump into it, but these two powerful words is what I learned with my background in news. So my early years as an anchor and reporter, I started off in Corpus Christi, which was market 128. I was a reporter making 825 an hour and the news director said, hey, how would you like to be the weekend evening anchor? I said, let's go. Got a raise to 10 bucks. And then this is kind of how my career went. Started in Corpus Christi, then went to Austin, Texas. Orlando and along the way covered some wild stories. So in Austin, our office was about a block away from the state capitol. So I was doing a lot of political reporting. Then I go to central Florida where 
there's a reason why Florida Man is a highly followed Twitter account. And when you read stories, it says Florida Man. So you can see I covered the shuttle launches, the shuttle retirement. I was camped out in front of Casey Anthony's house at three in the morning every day for months on end. And one of my colleagues got a tip about Tiger Woods running into a fire hydrant near his house, called me, and then we broke the story and you know what happened next during that whole drama. Along the way, been fortunate enough to win some awards. Over at WSB, we had a big night at the Emmys. Uh, I've done the parades. If you look closely, you can see there, my, in my wife's arms is our now five-year-old daughter. And then there's my wife and I at the uh, Business Chronicles 40 under 40. Um, so when you cover news, you'll cover small things and you'll cover big things. Been fortunate enough to cover the big political events. Here I am with John Lewis at the 2016 Democratic National Convention. Then when President Trump got elected, I was one of about 19 journalists invited to go have dinner with President Trump in the state dining room. Uh, he was not a fan, as you know, of, of national media. So he wanted the local media to come to the state dining room right before his joint address to Congress. And people are always curious, well, what in the world did you eat that night? Here's the menu. We had salad of arugula and watercress, braised short ribs and red wine and a warm apple crumble tart. And needless to say, it was a very entertaining dinner. So a lot of people, when they see what I've been doing in news, they ask, why in the world did you get out of news? Well, I noticed a major shift was underway. The viewing habits have dramatically changed as we know over the years. And I put this out there, the informal definition of news is information not previously known to someone. What changed that? The iPhone, our smartphones changed everything. We can get news when we want it, where we want it uh, with just lightning pace. So there's really not a need to tune in really like, like our parents used to do and still do for the four, five, six, and 11 o'clock newscast. All right, so as I'm a reporter, I'm getting PR pitches all the time. They really fill up our inboxes. We will glance at them. We might just hit that trash button icon or we might possibly pitch them. And I say, possibly, it's, it's, a, it's a small chance. It just depends. So seeing that, I'm like, why in the world? Some of these companies, these nonprofits, they have amazing stories. If the news doesn't come out, why are they not just sharing the story themselves? So that's what we do. Like we help them shine a light on all the good that they've been doing. And news, as we know, it can be very negative. So I wanted to focus on the positive. So that's what we started doing. We humanize them by creating compelling stories that will resonate with their followers. So how do you do it? Here's a quick example. One of our clients is in uh, the assisted living sector. So what's important to a potential resident or the adult child. It's all about trust and credibility if you're gonna put mom or dad there. But in senior living, their days revolve around meals and activities. So I'm thinking, well, let's start profiling some of the staff. Let's profile the chef. So we humanize the chef, if you will. Let's watch this video real quick. Making people happy with food, it's very rewarding to me. I love what I do, so. You hear people say, you, when you love what you do, it's not like a job. And you know, that definitely defines uh, the work that I do. I'm very creative, attention to details. In my presentation, I don't really have a specialty when it comes to a specific cuisine. I like to cook, you know, all, all different kinds of cuisines. I started out um, in retirement homes when I was about 19, and I got in with the ACF, the American Culinary Federation. I worked there for a couple of years. I um, was an apprentice with the ACF. I left there to go do some fine dining and finish my apprenticeship there. I ended up certifying as a sous chef in 2008. I worked in fine dining for a few more years. I went back into the retirement homes. Um, I got promoted there as a sous chef. Also worked as a sous chef in the fine dining restaurants I was in. And I just continued to work for a few years. It's more important than just being in a restaurant, you know, turning tables, especially the elderly people that, that we work for. Uh, they live here, you know, we feed them every day. Um, their days revolve around their meals. So I had a woman last week tell me she started crying because the squash that we made was just like her mother's, you know, and that was like really, really touching. Just knowing that I'm catering to needs that they may need, whether it's sugar-free, gluten-free, um, I take the time to talk to individuals every day. So it's a lot more personal than just serving in a restaurant. And it's, it's more to them, you know, the meals are very important. That definitely makes it all worth it. So that story is a minute 35. There's a reason in news why, hold on 
on one second. Why the uh, the news packages are about a minute 15, a minute 30. It's just because people are, you know, they're, we're all distracted and a minute 15, minute 30 is kind of the sweet spot. So the news, obviously, they're not going to cover that, but you can, which leads us to our motto. It's all about creating your news, identifying the stories within your organization, stories around you, and just go tell that story. We never really know what's going to take off, but we do know a good story when we see one, and literally we're surrounded by thousands of good stories every single day. So when you start creating your own stories, I say if it's good enough, they will come, they being journalists. And having been a journalist, we kind of know the way that they act, what they need, the stories they're going to pick up. And I'll tell you, if you have a good story and you put it on your social media account, it's going to pick up traction. If it's good, they'll see it and then they're going to come. So earn media and humanizing your brand. Let's take these as examples. For one of our clients in skilled nursing, unfortunately, these, these folks have been trapped in their, in their room. So we said, why don't we tap into the local humane society, have a doggy in the window event. We covered the event, put it on social media. It got picked up, as you can see, by CBS this morning, GMA, national media, and local media. Here on the left is with um, Military Kind, a brand under USA Today, veterans safely reuniting with their families. So we start telling those stories. On the bottom right, we had unity events. So these healthcare heroes could come out for candlelight vigils and recognize those who have been lost to the pandemic, but also it's a moment of hope. And so you can see that WRAL in uh, North Carolina covered that. All right, so when you humanize, you're building trust and loyalty. The other thing that I wanna tell you is if there is a moment for you to kind of tap into someone another brand out there, do it together. In this particular case, we wanted to do something with Waffle House. They have millions of followers. So we created this story. And again, during the pandemic, we've seen all the negative headlines. Let's focus on the positive. Let's shine a light on our, our nurse heroes. So let's watch this real quick. Obviously, there's a global pandemic, and we've been preparing for the outbreak in our service area for well over a month. Our caregivers are under very stressful situation as they fight the global pandemic. Nothing's comfort food like Waffle House, so we wanted to brighten their day and, and bring them a little treat to thank them for everything they're doing for us. When you go outside your job and see a Waffle House truck, <laughs> You're just overjoyed and it made us feel like we're more than partners. It made us feel like we're a family. Waffle House is always known for the Waffle House Index. Obviously, all restaurants are experiencing pressures, but they've been kind enough to help support our, our partners here. This is an emergency response vehicle built by Waffle House. Everybody loves Waffle House and everything is shut down. So still being able to have the best breakfast, that's a great thing. Our staff are working so very hard, so to bring them out here um, into the sunshine when they don't always get to come out in the middle of their shift to get some good Waffle House food um, and enjoy each other's company while social distancing, um, I think it's just absolutely fantastic, a great way to say thank you. I am extremely thankful that Pruitt Health and Waffle House partnered up. It is the ability for me to come to work today and a lot of my team, uh, this opportunity will allow us to keep a lot of associates working under the yellow sign. At Pruitt Health, uh, our mission statement is our family, your family, one family, committed to loving, giving, and caring, united in making a difference. I think you're seeing the Waffle House family and the Pruitt Health family come together and make sure that we're supporting the caregivers. They're on the front line of this battle against COVID-19 and we want to show our support for them. Thank you, the Pruitt family, and thank you, Waffle House. Thank you for feeding us. So this got shared by Waffle House uh, and their network. Again, they have thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers. Uh, shared it from Pruitt's network. All of those healthcare heroes, they share it on their own social media channels. And so suddenly you think, huh, we've actually reached a far larger audience than any audience that's watching the local news at four, five, and six. So just think like that when you're telling these stories, tapping into other networks, having problems, it keeps uh, repeating the story there. Let's see, okay, here we go. Now, the beautiful thing that uh, we have all come to recognize is how far technology, just from a news standpoint, 
has really evolved. Before we needed the big live trucks, we needed satellite trucks and everything to have remote reporters. Well, guess what? We're doing it right here. We're doing a live webinar over Zoom and technology is an amazing thing. So if you have the ability, get in the streaming game. You know, we, we are turning our clients into their no, own news outlets. Create your news. If the content is good enough, they will come. You're going to hear me keep saying that. So we are producing live shows for our clients. Here's one of our live shows that we do every other Friday. We actually, for the West Side Future Fund, we have a great live show coming up next Friday with Dr. Bernice King being interviewed by Maria Supporta of the Supporta Report. It's going to be fascinating. They're childhood friends. There are amazing stories on the west side of Atlanta that will not get covered on the local level, but we can cover it. And guess what? We're tapping into all these different networks and we're reaching the audience that we need to reach. So I'm just going to show you a quick clip of this. You have your main anchor or about on the, the left. West side program, which just how good of properties these are, talking from a design perspective. It's top-notch design, and that's one of the things that- So you know, that's- Benjamin Early, uh, we have now, I've been training him. He's a new West Side correspondent and we're going live just via Zoom. Uh, we have correspondents and we can go live from many different locations on the West Side. All right, so why is storytelling so important? It creates a connection for nonprofits to succeed and keep serving communities. The connection, as you know, is key. How are you helping? What do you wanna help or who do you wanna help and serve? Storytelling can put a face to your organization creating that connection that stats and facts simply cannot. Storytelling also spotlights important issues. So here's the truth. The media is not going to highlight the issues that are important to you. Even if they do, guess what? Someone else is in control of that narrative. Storytelling allows you to control the spotlight. So if you want to show people what's going on in the community and the problems you're trying to solve, you have to tell the story. The other thing I'm going to tell you, if you're pitching the media and they pick it up, it might get covered at four o'clock, but guess what? It's going to be a quick little hit and it's gone. They might not put it on their website. If you cover it, you control that content. You can repurpose it and revisit it either a day, week, or a month, or even a year down the line. We repurpose videos that are a year old. So just keep that in mind. All right. It is more important now to create your own content. Look at these numbers. We are seeing record video consumption. I believe that video is the most important medium out there. Look at YouTube and Facebook have seen a 40% increase in daily live stream video views when comparing the daily average since March of 2019. Cord cutting numbers, I cord cut it about two years ago. I'll never look back. Cord cutting now accounts for about 20% of US households in 2020, raising their numbers to a staggering total of 25.3 million. That number's even higher since this slide was made. And then streaming trends. Time spent on streaming platforms grew by 34% since the beginning of March. Guess what? The mobile channel right here is the new channel. It's the new TV channel. All right, so content really humanizes everything. I made this graph here to show you. It all centers around content, but guess what? I always say no good social media channel or website is good without great content. You create the content, you leverage it through social media, throw some money behind it on Facebook, Google ads, YouTube in stream ads, then you're going to see exponential social growth. And again, if it's good enough, they will come, you will get your earned media. On the website side, look at this, Google owns YouTube. You start pumping out those videos, put them on YouTube, Embed the video on your website, drive traffic. If you're putting your YouTube video on your social media channel, drive that traffic to your website. Guess what? Your SEO rankings are going to start to jump. Search engine optimization. No coincidence that Google owns YouTube. All right, here we go. So here's just an example of a client. They were flatlining on their social media side, not doing much, tapped us. We jumped in, said, you guys got a million stories. Let's start telling them. And then, you, as I mentioned, you can have exponential growth. One social media post here on the right, we can reach nearly half a million people. Engagement is key. Those are people obviously engaging with the comment, posting it, sharing it, commenting on it. And look, within one week period, we reached a million people, far larger than what you're going to reach on nightly news. So I wanted to show you these graphs as well when it comes to website traffic, analytical reporting, launch the new website, you're going to see steady growth. 
and it's all about the content on the website, content in the form of videos, pictures, articles. Look over here, 65% mobile consumption. I'm gonna to get to that in a second. Content posted on the back end of these websites, since we're in the content game, why aren't we just creating websites as well? That's what we started doing. You can see where we're posting the content. If you look at the back end of your website and you push out a valuable article, you're gonna see these spikes. Mobile content consumption. Remember how I said that mobile TV is the new TV channel? Make sure all of you watching that your website is optimized for mobile. Look, 67% on this particular website, they're looking at it on their phone. So a quick case study, here's uh, one of our clients. They were just getting hit hard when, it, when the pandemic hit. Uh, again, as I mentioned off the top, we kind of know that how reporters think, how they're going to approach the story. Of course, I don't tell them that because that kind of makes them mad. Uh, but so within the first 60 days, we were fielding literally hundreds of media inquiries. And we really had to flip the switch. Sure, there's a lot of negative stories with the pandemic, but we got to start counting that with positive stories, the nurse hero stories, the doctor hero stories. You know, we have enough negativity in our lives. People are going to start seeking out the positive stories. So we started doing it. It caught traction. And those reporters saw it on the social media channels called, hey, I saw that nurse story that you, the nurse you profiled. Is there any way we could speak with the nurse? Of course you can. And since you can't get into these centers, here are some video for you for your report. So within the first 60 days of the partnership, we produced 553 social posts, resulting in nearly 90,000 engagements on social media. The, uh, they had a leading PR firm in the world. Uh, unfortunately, they just were not prepared for the pandemic. So um, it's all about engaging with your own followers. You have a brand, your followers follow you because they're loyal to you. So make sure you're feeding them good stuff. All right, let's get into your first steps to applying these strategies. Your story, again, it starts with the content, comes first, but you gotta make it compelling. Try to add value. Don't just plug your business, make it resonate. From our company standpoint, we're just putting out articles about the five keys to uh, doing digital marketing the right way. Like, I don't want to sit here and plug, plug, plug. Let's just go out and tell people what they need to do. Hence why we're having this humanized series. We want you to know what to do and how to do it. Also, you got to share that content across your platforms, but you got to be strategic about it. In some cases, it's, let's take a law firm. A law firm doesn't necessarily need content on Facebook. Their, their bread and butter is going to be LinkedIn. They need to show folks the big case that they won or profile their attorney. But let's say that that lawyer is doing some good pro bono work with a nonprofit. You tell the story. It comes from the law firm's channels. But we're going to put that on Facebook to reach a larger audience. And we want that nonprofit and everybody affiliated with the nonprofit to share that story because it's not necessarily LinkedIn. So you got to be strategic about where you're pushing that content. Oh, and I want you to remember this. Content is and will always be king. Don't forget it. So thank you guys so much for joining us on this morning to kind of talk about humanizing your brand. I'm going to stop sharing. And let's see, I, I, Sam, how did I do on the timing? Did I? You did fantastic. <laughs> okay, good. Thank and you so uh, much, I was man. trying to bring the energy. I've got black coffee with an espresso shot and I'm ready to go. Everybody have coffee today? Oh, I've got two cups of coffee. I'm ready to go as well. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Craig. A really insightful presentation. I liked how you put the human at the center of the story. And I also might need the number for that Waffle House truck, but uh, we could talk oh, after this. It was so good. <laughs> um, okay, so um, everyone watching, feel free to write some questions in the Q&A chat. We will get to them after our next presentation is complete. Um, so I'll give you a second there. Um, but now we're gonna be moving to our next speaker, Taylor Kincaid, who is going to discuss the evolution of relatability on social media. Um, before she starts, let's get to know Taylor a bit more. So Taylor Kincaid is the social media director and Atlanta agency lead at Online Optimism. Online Optimism is an award-winning full-service digital marketing agency with offices in New Orleans and Atlanta. Taylor manages over 50 social media accounts, 
using both paid and organic strategies, and she connects organizations to their target audiences. Taylor is an expert at both learning and shaping a brand's voice to create personable, culturally relevant, and timely messaging that drives desired outcomes for clients' businesses. So without further ado, take it away, Claire. Taylor. Sorry about that. Thanks for that intro, Sam. All right. Make sure I've got my presentation going. Everyone can see that OK? Great. OK. Move to the top. All righty. So as Sam mentioned, uh, I'm Taylor Kincaid. I'm the social media director at Online Optimism. I've been with Online Optimism for almost five years now, but in digital marketing for a little over eight years. And it's a little crazy to say out loud, but yes, I do oversee 50 plus social media channels. And just a fun fact about me, um, I do have a 120 pound bloodhound. His name is Ali. He keeps me very busy when I'm not working. All right. So we're kind of going to jump in today. As Sam mentioned, I'm talking about the evolution of relatability on social media um, and kind of talking about how you can, you know, make your brand more human on social by looking at this evolution and uh, applying some of this to your small business, big brand, medium business this is applicable for all sizes. So for when social media kind of first started coming about, Brands sort of slowly trickled in on the platform after they had already been established for personal use. But really, Twitter was one of the first social media networks that um, encouraged brands to get humans. So we kind of see this evolution here. It's a little funny, but um, 2013, you see things like a major brand's Twitter account using the word they. By 2018, things like the Wendy's Twitter account cursing at people being kind of that playground bully on Twitter, they became very, very famous for. So we see that evolution happen over five years, you know, it happened pretty slowly, but once it did start to happen, it started to happen even more quickly. And food companies, as I mentioned with Wendy's, were kind of some of the first brands to really get human on Twitter. So for Moon Pie, they kind of took on this relatable um, personal persona um, and then Wendy's, the, as I said, they kind of took on that like more playground bully snarky kind of thing that be, they became very famous for. And for Twitter, like I said, it's really one of the first social networks that had an audience that encouraged brands to get human. And brands began to see more success by posting the funniest or even most viral tweets they could think of. Um, Wendy's was not afraid to play with their own audience and call out other brands and a lot of other brands started to mimic that as well. And we'll talk about this in a second, but brands like, you know, a huge brand like Heinz would use things like polls asking their audience what they want to see and then seeing that success not only on social but in stores as well. So massive brands began to take that human approach pretty early on with platforms like Twitter. But even in 21, we often see small businesses still using social as a way to push out announcements and updates, but not really thinking about how they can be communicating with their audience in a more human way. So how can we be doing better? That's really what we're going to be focusing on today. Something else I want to talk about, some of y'all may have heard of social listening and be super familiar with it. This may be a totally new term for some of you too, so we'll talk about that. As I mentioned, a brand like Heinz um, leveraged social listening pretty early on with things like a Twitter poll. Um, so they kind of used this strategy to launch a new product. They used social listening to see that people were really interested in Heinz Mayo Chup and used this Twitter poll to actually launch a new product. And they used data from social to back that up and see huge success in stores. So what is social listening? Um, a lot of you may know social monitoring and think that is social listening. Um, so I wanna kind of talk about the distinction between the two. So monitoring tells us what, while listening tells us why. Social media monitoring is all about caring for your customers by monitoring social media for messages directly related to your brand and responding to those messages appropriately. So things like DMs, direct messages, um, messages to your Facebook, comments that mention you, um, tweets that mention you, those are all monitoring. While listening is all about understanding your audience and improving campaign strategy 
by accessing the full spectrum of conversation around your industry, brand, or any topics relevant to your brand. So this is outside of that direct message type of realm and more just about chatter and things that may not directly mention you. So while you may not have a huge conversation happening around your brand like Heinz, um, you still can use things like social listening for your small business. You can look at things like considering your competition, what does their audience like or not like about products or services, and what content performs well with your competitors versus what flops. You can also use this for things like brand expansions. So looking at like, you may think an audience in a certain geographic area will perform one way, but data may tell you something totally different. So you can be ahead of the curve, even if you know your industry very well in one area, but you can use that brand expansion data, data to uh, better um, understand your industry somewhere you may not be. And social listening gives us tons of data. And of course, as marketers, we love data. So it's a really great tool to use. And I also wanna talk about leveraging communities. Um, Instagram is really one of the best platforms for leveraging communities uh, because they have great features like hashtags that people can now follow. So um, while Instagram may not be the easy to grow organic platform, it was once years ago, um, you really need a high quality content strategy that will match or elevate the content found on the platform. But one of the best ways to reach is to cultivate an audience and to focus on building communities. So one of the best ways I mentioned is to use things like hashtags and people that follow hashtags. So one of the best examples of that online is this fans girls hashtag. Um, it's a huge, massive community has like over a half a million posts. Um, obviously, you may not have that much chatter around your brand, but they really use this in a great way that allows their audience to create content for them, which they then use on their own profiles. And we do this on a smaller scale for our client called the Downtown Development District of New Orleans. Um, and we use this in a way that allows us to, like Vans Girls does, get our community to create content for us, which we then share. So the DDD's goal is really to get people to come out downtown. And if they're excited about sharing their content online, um, we get excited about sharing it for them and sharing it on our profiles. So while we don't have half a million posts, we have almost 50,000, uh, which is pretty good for you know a smaller local business and it has really helped us to um, increase the DDD's following and standing in the community. And I wanna talk about LinkedIn too. Um, LinkedIn was really kind of that last social network that was dedicated to more of like a buttoned up approach to social. Um, considering LinkedIn is all about business, definitely makes sense. And a couple years ago, we even actually used to tell our clients to not even use emojis on LinkedIn. Kind of a mistake, that's okay. We learn from it and pivot. That's what social is all about. It's all about being flexible. Um, but yeah, we've seen a big shift in the way LinkedIn works and the way people engage on the platform. So unlike a lot of other social networks, LinkedIn is actually growing. Um, from 2019 to 2020, LinkedIn saw 55% more conversations between connected members, 60% more content created on the platform, and 22% increase in messages sent over a year ago. So while platforms like maybe Facebook you've heard are decreasing in members, LinkedIn is growing pretty massively. And people started to really get creative on LinkedIn too over the past year. So this is an example of a personal post. It's pretty long form, it's only text. There's no pictures, images, video here. Um, she uses emojis as you can see it and she uses super relatable and personal language. And this has over 1200 reactions, 150 comments. So this type of content really is what we're seeing more and more on LinkedIn and is what is performing well. I also have an example from Sprout Social here. 
Um, this is again, another just completely text-based conversation. And it's all about encouraging your community to comment and get engaged with your content. So while we may have a few years ago said this type of content only makes somewhere makes sense somewhere like Twitter, we're seeing more and more of this content on LinkedIn as well. And just an example of how you can bring this to your small business. Uh, this is some, these are a couple of posts from actually online optimism. Uh, as you can see, we use a selfie with somebody from our team named Irene. She's talking in this webinar series as well. Um, she's holding up a bottle of wine, doing just a celebratory post. This is a little bit more informal, maybe something we wouldn't have posted on LinkedIn years ago, but this is really what is performing well there now. And then we also have, can't see this as an animation here today. That's okay though. Um, so this is an animation, just a little bit more informal. Um, but these are the things that are really performing well on LinkedIn now. So what are your steps, first steps at applying this? So think about things like what is your brand voice? If you think about that first, you'll be able to be more human and attract an audience to you online. So are you snarky like Wendy's, relatable like Moon Pie? Or with online optimism, you know, we really aim to be optimistic, fun, approachable. Um, what is the data telling you? Social media is filled with lots of conversations and engagements, and those interactions are filled with valuable data. So what insights can you have gained to help you be more successful in the future? And are you building up your online community? Don't just talk out your community. You always want to be social on social media. So talk to them, nurture that relationship in every interaction you have. And finally, uh, don't be afraid to break the rules. <laughs> Putting your brand in a box like, we don't use emojis on LinkedIn could actually hold you back from meaningful, meaningful engagements on socials. So experiment with new content, try out new features early, and most importantly, aim to be human. Thank y'all. Um, if you wanna reach out to me, this is my email. And of course, feel free to engage with us on social media. All of our profiles are here. All right, thank you so much, Taylor. That was a really interesting presentation. It's really funny how LinkedIn, social media, it's all evolved over these past 10 years or so. And um, I've definitely seen the change personally as well. So interesting to see that laid out like that. <clears throat> okay, so um, please take some time to jot down any questions you may have for Taylor or Craig. Um, we're gonna go to the Q&A chat and ask some questions uh, of them both right now. Um, so feel free to take some time to write your own and, uh, and we will get started with the Q&A. So uh, we'll start with Craig. <clears throat> um, all right. Um, Craig, uh, you spoke a lot about how organizations can make feel good stories um, and really connect with different audiences. <clears throat> How do you see that happening with maybe more private companies, not necessarily nonprofits? And how can they uh, really highlight feel good stories in, in that sense? Um, I think from private private company standpoint, it all depends on their goals. We've had some clients come to us and just say, we don't want external facing videos. We want internal facing videos like we have 200 employees that uh, should be working with each other instead of outsourcing some work. And so um, in that particular case, it was important that we profile the people within the organization um, and tell their stories. But when we did that, um, I think it's important when you're creating these videos to humanize the brand, humanize people, that you do make them in a way that they can be external. So let's use the law firm example. They, um, they have all these attorneys who don't know each other. So we go in and we, and we humanize that attorney. You know, there, a lot of attorneys can be buttoned up and not willing to open up. But it's amazing how much one video can create a connection, not only with that attorney with their peer, but also someone who might see it on LinkedIn. Um, it's funny when you do get on LinkedIn, one of your close friends might post something about what they did at work and you have no idea. 
Um, so it's important that you share as a private company what you're up to. Um, and if it's not going to be external, make sure when you create it that it can eventually be external. Because the best thing that people can do is when they start talking about what they're up to at work is it's great for an internal piece, but make it so it can be shared external. And the same goes for like wealth management too. Um, there's so many wealth management companies out there where their wealth managers just have like their mugshot and a bio. But we're talking about people that are investing people's livelihoods. So usually that business is word of mouth. A friend of a friend says, hey, you need to go talk to John Smith. He's done really well with my money. Well, then that person who heard that's going to go look into John Smith and do their own research, read their bio, see their picture, but a video of John saying, I got in this business because unfortunately my grandfather picked the wrong financial advisor and lost all his money. I want to make sure that never happened to my clients. And that's why I'm in the business. And just that short little story will change the whole dynamics of someone picking their next wealth advisor so mm -hmm. it's all as we know humanizing people bringing them out of their shells focusing on that individual yes i like that okay next question is for taylor um <clears throat> does brand voice have to be funny to be human um and what's your view uh on the opportunities there that's a great question. Um, obviously, it's really easy to pull an example like Wendy's, where it's so obviously human, but there are lots of other brands that I think do the humanizing approach to their social media presence super well in a not funny or smart, snarky way. Um, just one example I just thought of off the top of my head is uh, Patagonia. So if you go to their profile, they're all about being inspiring. They're all about you know their environmental approach to their business. And whenever you go to any of their social profiles or any of their entities online, that human type of um, approach to their online presence is so consistent and very clear. Um, so there are a ton of different ways that you can definitely approach it. I think the key is just being consistent, having clear, you know, persona for your brand, whether it's something funny, something like we want to be inspiring to our followers and really communicate our brand message or um, doing things, you know, that are more just about, you know, we want to appear approachable, but we don't want to uh, be too funny or maybe turn people off. Um, we have a lot of brands like that that we work with definitely, but loosening up things like using emojis to help break up some of your content and text um, really helps. And those are a lot of tips that we give to brands that may be newer to social or maybe taking that approach, but don't want to be like, totally edgy or out there, which is completely understandable. So that's a great question. Right, so it seems like you don't really have to be edgy in order to be authentic to what your brand represents. And that kind of seems to be the more important element of it. Interesting. Yep. Okay. Um, we've actually got another question for Taylor that kind of relates to this. So I'll just jump right back to this one. How can brands be relatable without looking phony? And they're that, that authenticity question comes up again. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about being authentic. And um, I do think at Online Optimism, this is something we do well. We always point to things like our brand values. Um, so that's something that we defined, you know, years ago that we always point to. And whenever we have a question about, okay, you know, does this, this post match up with who we are? We look to things like our values. So I think setting those things, whether it's, you know, writing out what your brand persona is before you even start posting, having a roadmap to point back to will make sure you don't end up being phony because you'll never get outside of that, you know, idea of who you are as a brand. Interesting. All right, we got one more for Craig. Um, I'm gonna read the whole kind of scenario and question out loud. <clears throat> I want to create stories that shine a light on people and projects that highlight intersections of art and science. Both spaces are filled with curiosity, exploration, and innovation. The audiences are really different though. Do you have any ideas uh, for ways to build a, a, a story 
that tailors to both audiences and is relatable for both? Great question. Um, so years ago, and I don't know if it's still out there, there was a show called Iconoclast, and it was like Robert De Niro interviewing Al Pacino. And I think you could do a story with an artist interviewing a scientist. And then they can question each other and explain their backgrounds and they can showcase for the artists, they can showcase their work. Uh, for the scientists, they can showcase the, the latest science, scientific breakthrough they're working on. Um, so it is a hybrid. Um, but I think you could have an in, a whole interesting series of art and science with an artist sitting down with a scientist. Um, the main thing you want to do in these with these stories is um, really pull that artist out of their shell. And also, when it comes to putting them on video, it's always good not to just have the sit down interview. I like active shots. So have that artist maybe do, doing their best at, at drawing their next work of art and interviewing them while they're doing it. And then, uh, and then showcase the work as it's happening. So, I mean, the great thing about these iPhones is they shoot in 1080i HD. I have, you know, my last year at WSB, if there wasn't a photographer available, I'm like, that's okay. And I'd take this sucker and I'd go and shoot this video horizontally, pass it off to my editor and the producers and managers had no idea. <laughs> I mean, they, because it's the quality is so good now. So you can easily just go and interview the artist and then you can go interview the scientists or I would say, get them together. And then when you, as far as making an appeal to both audiences, make sure that those interviewees are sharing it within their own network. So it's not just you pushing out, hey, I, I'm doing this story. They're also saying, hey, you got to check out my latest interview with this artist. Absolutely. I like the idea of just kind of sticking them in a room together and, uh, and having them interview each other and see what happens. I think there's a lot of overlap between art and science, um, you know, in theory that doesn't actually maybe happen in practice. So um, I would watch that TV show. Uh, uh, I think sure. it'd be interesting. Go ahead. <laughs> Who asked this question? Oh, I didn't, I didn't see, but uh, Mia. Yeah, Mia, go do it. Have, sit them both down and do the piece. Um, okay, we got a couple more questions. Um, one more for Taylor, um, and then we'll wrap up with the last one for Craig. Um, <clears throat> Taylor, so what do you think the next big platform for brands uh, wanting to be more relatable on social is? So what's that next big platform? Love this question. Um, and I purposefully didn't talk about this platform, actually, because we have another talk in this webinar series specifically centered around it. Uh, that is TikTok. TikTok is huge right now. You've probably heard it in some headlines. Um, it is very approachable, very human. Um, and yeah, my coworker, Mira McNitt, she's going to be doing a talk on this in this webinar series. If you're interested in TikTok and how you could use it for your a brand, specifically a small business that maybe isn't like the most fun industry. Um, she runs our TikTok for online optimism and does a great job. And uh, she's going to be talking about a lot of cool stuff there. But yeah, TikTok is huge and it's just a really fun platform. And you really can't be on it without being human. So definitely that one. Yeah, I, I you know, I didn't know anything about TikTok a year ago and now I spend uh, a lot of time on it. So uh, I think that, again, going back to that authenticity part is really interesting. I'm excited to hear that. Um, that next talk. Um, okay, all right, last question we have is for Craig. Um, and uh, I think you'll like this one. Is there a limit to how much content you can share? And what's that, yeah. what is that limit and, uh, and how do you know? Yeah, never, there's never a limit. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say that many companies, they'll, they'll go, okay, I don't have a landing page video on my website and they'll go do that landing page video and they'll, get it on their website, that's great. And then they're like, okay, did my part. That's for, like, it's good that you did that part, but you gotta keep that constant content flow. It keeps your channels active. It's giving your brand followers more about what you do, what you're up to. Um, I love what Taylor was talking about, making sure that it is authentic 
everything you do should be authentic. And again, don't just plug your business. If you're uh, like Taylor's presentation was awesome, um, showing like the mayo chuck, like be, that is very cool that, that that brand did that, like engaging with people and doing the polls. I think that's amazing. And then if you do a poll like that, I think a follow-up would be go talk to people and go taste the mayo chuck. Hey, you had a voice in this. And so it's just constantly pushing out videos and literally videos pre-pandemic, we were doing like high end, we'd have like five crew members and we still will do that. But, you know, just doing Zoom profiles with people is fun. Like video podcasts side by side. If you want to, we, we did one about the story behind the story. We profiled the news anchor who tossed to that, the leprechaun story in Alabama and got the story behind the story, you know, where they're like the leprechauns up in the tree and this guy's <laughs> like, oh, I have this flute from a thousand years ago. Like, that's just fun. Mm -hmm. um, so just keep, keep that constant content flow going. I do have a quick question for Taylor about, you mentioned that TikTok. Um, what are your quick thoughts on Clubhouse? Yeah, so I actually got an invite from Sam. Thank you, Sam, to Clubhouse a few weeks ago. Um, you know, I've spent a little bit of time on it, but I think it's very unique. I've never seen a social network like that, you know, where it's just more conversation audio based and not something visual at all. So it's totally different. But I think that it's really interesting because we've seen things like podcasts just totally explode in the past, you know, three, four or five years. Um, and I feel like this is kind of like a continuation of that where you can have these real conversations that aren't marketed or, you know, packaged up like a podcast, but people love talking and you're able to talk to people in your industry um, that do things similar to you, um, you know, that may not be in a geographical area close to you. So this pandemic has kind of uh, forced us all to to be a little bit more open to those types of conversations with people we haven't met in person yet. And I think Clubhouse is a great continuation of that. So um, I haven't seen a ton of brand work on there yet, but I'm really excited to see what happens because obviously it's coming. Yeah, they're jumping in. Absolutely. And I think if there's one thing that all these streaming networks have shown us in the past year or so, it's that there really is never enough content um, and it just keeps coming. So. Um, that is it with our questions, and um, we'll do a little wrap up and a little housekeeping. So um, first of all, I just want to give another special thanks to our speakers. Thank you so much, Craig. Thank you so much, Taylor. Um, you can find Craig and Taylor on their respective social platforms, and I will post those as well. Um, <clears throat> just again, Craig Lucy is the founder of Lucy, the brand strategy and PR firm that helps organizations tell their own stories. You can find his company at lucycontent.com or follow him on Twitter at Craig Lucy. <clears throat> Taylor Kincaid is the social media director and Atlanta agency lead at Online Optimism, full service digital marketing company in New Orleans and Atlanta. And you can find our organizations at onlineoptimism.com or on Twitter at Online Optimism. So don't forget to sign up for our next webinar. Again, this is a six part series, so there are five more to go. Um, we'll be posting a link on our social media channels uh, but feel free to reach out if you have any questions, uh, info at onlineoptimism.com. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. Really appreciate it and, uh, and have a great day. Thank y'all. Bye, everyone. Thanks, y'all. Bye.